motivation and emotion, the whys of behavior. Zig Ziglar once said, people often say that motivation doesn't last. Well, neither does bathing. That's why we recommend it daily. Motivation takes work and we need to have an understanding of what are those things, those whys, those motives that drive our behavior. And once you can understand what drives your behavior, you can use that to reach your goals, to be successful, and to really become the individual that you want to be. Motivation is a need or desire that energizes and directs behavior. What are this athlete's motives? When we look at motives, we look at motives that are biological, cognitive, social, and emotional. Some characteristics of motivation include activation, which is the initiation or the production of a behavior, and persistence, which are continued efforts or determination to achieve a goal. Also, intensity, greater vigor in responding, which often accompanies motivated behavior. Intrinsic motivation is that motivation that says, I did it because I wanted to. I did it because it made me feel good. Extrinsic motivation says, I love learning, but I wanted the diploma. So intrinsic, sorry, intrinsic motivation involves the desire to engage in tasks that are inherently satisfying and enjoyable. Maybe they're novel or they're optimally challenging to do something for its own sake. Extrinsic motivation looks at external flat factors or influences on behavior such as rewards, consequences, and social expectations. Other kinds of motivation include approach motivation, which is a motivation to experience a positive outcome. Avoidance motivation is the motivation not to experience a negative outcome. So to what extent does each of these items describe you? The green print measures the strength of avoidance tendency and the red print measures the strength of approach tendency. So let's look at these. Even though something bad is about to happen to me, I rarely experience fear or nervousness. What kind of motivation? Low avoidance. If you experienced fear or nervousness, then that would have been high avoidance. When I'm doing well at something, I love to keep at it. What kind of motivation? High approach. When I see an opportunity for something, I, for something, I get excited right away. Again, high approach. If I think something unpleasant is going to happen, I usually get pretty worked up. Oop, sorry. <laughs> High avoidance. And I have very few fears compared to my friends. Low avoidance. So hopefully those examples helped you to understand the difference between approach and avoidance motivation and when approach is high or low and when avoidance is high or low. There are various theories of motivation. Some biological theories involve the instinct theory of motivation. The instinct, instincts are a complex behavior that is rigidly patterned throughout a species and is unlearned. Instinct theory says that certain human behaviors are innate or inborn and due to evolutionary programming. So basically, this states that genes predispose us to act in a particular way. And for example, an, an example of this would be newborn reflexes in humans. 
Another theory of motivation, or theories of motivation, involve the drive and incentive theories. In order to understand these theories, we have to understand what homeostasis is. Homeostasis is the tendency to maintain a balanced or constant internal state. Incentives are positive or negative environmental stimuli that motivates behavior. Arousal theory is the view that people are motivated to maintain a level of arousal that is optimal, neither too high or too low. For people that have low arousal, it may lead to boredom, and they may be motivated to seek out stimulation. People that are experiencing high arousal may experience overstimulation and hence may be motivated to seek out something that would calm them. We all have different needs for arousal. Some of us may have higher needs and some of us may have lower needs. People that have high needs for arousal or stimulation um, have also been known as sensation seekers or thrill seekers. They may be more likely to um, you know, um, take more risks or jump out of airplanes or drive real fast um, or put themselves in kind of risky situations. And people that have lower needs may avoid those situations and they may, you know, be more introverted. They might be happier with just staying home and not taking risks or chances. The yerkes dodson Law states that when we have a moderate level of arousal, not too much, not too little, that is when we are at our optimal performance. Another theory of motivation has to do with Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and this is a humanistic theory. Maslow created a pyramid or a hierarchy of human needs that must first be satisfied before higher level safety needs and then psychological needs become active. So he believes that we start at the very bottom of the pyramid with our physiological needs and once those are met, we move on to our safety needs and once those are met, we move up to belongingness and love needs and so on and so forth till we meet these self-actualization needs and self-transcendence needs. Maslow believes that we are all motivated to become self-actualized, and self-actualization involves becoming the very best version of yourself. Now, this will be different for every individual, but he believed that this is truly what motivates human behavior. And he believes that in order to become self-actualized, in order to become the very best version of ourselves, we need to meet all of these needs first before we can get there. Other psychological perspectives that are related to motivation include the self-determination theory. This theory states that optimal human functioning can occur only if psychological needs for autonomy, competence, and relatedness are satisfied. Three needs that must be satisfied for psychological growth and success are these three. Autonomy involves being in control of one's own goals and behavior. It's that sense of personal control. Competence has to do with capability, mastering appropriately challenging tasks. And relatedness is feeling attachment to others with security and intimacy. So this self-determination theory believes that for psychological growth and success, an individual must be able to satisfy these three needs. Other theories related to motivation include competence motivation and achievement motivation. Competence motivation involves striving to be capable and exercising control. Achievement motivation, striving to excel and outperform others. Some of us are motivated 
in terms of competence and some of us are motivated in terms of achievement and maybe some are motivated in both or neither. But these are two other theories that help to explain what drives human behavior. We are also motivated by the need to belong and the need to connect. This is also referred to as our affiliation need. We are social beings and the set, there is a central human motivation to be affiliated with others. Motivated behaviors are acted, activated by a complex interaction of biological, social, and psychological factors. One of the most powerful motivators, which is both a biological and psychological motive, is hunger. Hello and welcome to Nerd Sanctum. Today we'll be talking about what hunger really is, how it's influenced, and what we can do about it. From a biological point of view, the sensation of hunger is really a balance of hormones and chemicals. This balance has two sides, hunger and satiety, which is the feeling of fully satisfying a desire or appetite. Both of these sides operate in the same part of the brain. Hunger is controlled by the lateral hypothalamus. Every time that part of the brain is stimulated, it causes you to feel hunger. In fact, if you cut or damage the lateral hypothalamus, you will never feel hungry ever again. Satiety is controlled by the ventromedial hypothalamus, and it works similarly. Every time that part of the brain is stimulated, it causes you to feel full. And if you cut or damage it, you would never feel full ever again. So now that we understand this balance, let's look at the causes of hunger. Hunger can be caused by a variety of factors, both environmental and physiological. Some examples of environmental causes are you know, friends inviting you to a meal, being bored or stressed, smelling food, or forgetting the last time that you ate. While some physiological examples would be needing to intake more energy, having unbalanced hormones, genetic causes, or damage to parts of your body that regulate hunger. With these categories in mind, we see environmental causes are usually a craving, a desire to eat to fulfill needs other than hunger, or really are a want. While physiological causes are due to a need, managing environmental causes or wants is mostly an act of self-control. But that decision can be hard, because who doesn't love food, right? Especially since our brains are evolved to love large and quick sources of energy like sugar and proteins, which are pretty much in every food product that was designed by an entire industry to work off our desires to make money. Managing physiological causes or needs can be difficult too. There's a thing called set point theory which is a genetically programmed weight range that a metabolic system tries to maintain. This means your hypothalamus turns on and off your hunger impulses and regulates your metabolic rate in order to change your weight to something that it defines as optimal. Now, some people find this hard to accept, but it's just like any other pre-programmed attribute like height or hair color. So now that we understand what hunger is and what causes and influences it, is there anything we can do about it? Yes, there are plenty of small things people can do to meet their physiological needs while satisfying their environmental wants. Some things would be eating smaller meals more frequently with all nutrition categories. This way you never get too hungry and binge and you get all the inputs your body needs to function distributed evenly throughout the day to feel energetic and not drowsy. Nutrient balancing is better than calorie counting. Drink liquids and eat filling appetizers like soup or salad. This way your body naturally hits its set point quicker without having to consume more energy dense foods that could leave excess energy. Then there are quirky tips like use small plates, keep a journal of what you eat, and eat in a room away from the food so you have to get up. All these are small things to keep you aware about your habits and limit incentives. I'm obviously not a health expert, but to me the rule of thumb is simply be confident and do what makes you happy in moderation. If you deprive yourself of happiness for too long, you'll end up crashing or binging and that's what really leads to problems. Anyways, that's, Anyways, that's all I have for today. I'd like to hear if you have any thoughts, stories, or tips down in the comments below. And Understanding hunger and energy balance can be a little confusing, but to help you understand it a little bit better, it's good to know what energy homeostasis is, and that's that long-term matching of food intake to energy expenditure. Basal metabolic rate, or BMR, 
is at rest the rate at which your body uses energy for vital functions. So you can kind of look at that balance or that energy homeostasis. Calories consumed match calories expended. There's that homeostasis, that balance. Positive energy balance, calorie intake exceeds expenditure and that can lead to weight gain. Negative energy balance is when calorie intake falls short and that can lead to weight loss. The physiology of hunger. Glucose is a form of sugar that circulates in the blood and provides a major source of energy. Orexigenic signals tell the brain to switch hunger on. Anorexigenic signals tell the brain to switch hunger off. When glucose level is low, we feel hunger. Appetite hormones also play a role in our experience of hunger. The psychology of eating. There are psychological factors in food intake. One has to do with conditioning. Meal times and settings. Have we learned to associate certain things with meal times and settings? So we may not actually be hungry, but because we've been conditioned to eat, let's say, dinner at six o'clock every night, or you know, that we eat at a certain place, that may motivate hunger behaviors and hence eating. Taste preferences that are reinforced is another psychological factor in food intake. So you may not actually be hungry, but because that just tastes so good or makes us feel so good, that is reinforced and hence we may be more likely to eat it next time. Cultural influences, traditions or um, other, other types, types of foods or ways of eating or how much to eat or when to eat or how to eat, all of these cultural influences can also play a role in our eating behaviors. And people that have very adventuresome appetites, this could also um, influence eating behaviors. Eating disorders. Did you know that four out of 10 Americans have either suffered or have known someone who suffered from an eating disorder? What motivates disturbed eating behaviors? When we talk about eating disorders, we talk about disorders such as anorexia nervosa, or self-starvation, bulimia nervosa, which is an eating disorder that is characterized by periods of binging on food, and then purging, whether it's through vomiting, or the use of laxatives, or excessive exercise. And also binge eating disorder, which is where an individual will binge on large amounts of food, usually at times where they are feeling distressed or anxious or depressed or angry or any type of um, emotion. So what motivates these disturbed eating behaviors, whether we're eating too much or too little or not at all? Individual and social pressure to achieve unrealistic standards of thinness play a role. Negative emotions, perfectionism, control, a history of childhood sexual or physical abuse, and biological factors that include genetics and malfunctioning brain mechanisms. Emotions. Emotions are a complex psychological state or response. There are numerous components of emotions. There is a physiological arousal that occurs when we experience an emotion. There are expressive behaviors and consciously experienced thoughts and feelings. 
There are numerous functions of emotions. Emotions can act as triggers of motivated behavior. They can contribute to rational decision making and purposeful behavior. They can help in the understanding and maintenance of relationships. And lastly, emotions reflect evolutionary adaptations to the problems of survival and reproduction. There have been many different theories of emotions that have been proposed by a variety of researchers throughout the years. The first theory of emotion was proposed by James Langa. These are two individuals, William James um, and Langa. This particular theory states that our experience of emotion is our awareness of our physiological responses to emotion arousing stimuli. So the James Langa theory states that we experience physiological arousal as a reaction to the perception of a stimulus. So in this example, the sight of an oncoming car leads us to experience that physiological arousal which we then deduce to be a particular emotion, fear, in this example. Canon Bard theory states that in reaction to a particular stimulus, we simultaneously experience the pounding heart, the arousal, and the fear, the emotion. And the Schachter-Singer two-factor theory states that we experience physiological arousal and a cognitive label, and then once we experience that at the same time, we can then deduce which, which emotion we are experiencing. Emotion in the two-tracked brain. Some emotions, such as basic likes and dislikes and fear, may be experienced without the involvement of conscious appraisal. Some ero emotional responses involve a low neural pathway that bypasses the cortex. Such responses also happen too quickly for us to be consciously aware of them. So the, the high road, the thinking high road, we take in a fear stimulus, the thalamus takes that information and sends a message to our sensory cortex, the prefrontal cortex, and then to the um, amygdala where we have our fear response. The speedy low road is a very quick, efficient way to experience that emotion before we are really thinking or consciously thinking about it. So that fear stimulus is directed from the thalamus directly to the amygdala where we experience that fear immediately. Basic emotions. The basic emotions are joy, happiness, interest or excitement, surprise, sadness, anger, disgust, contempt, fear, shame, and guilt. Basic emotions are biologically determined. Most of these are present at birth. They are culturally universal in meaning and subjective experience, and often experienced in blends or as mixed emotions. Emotional intelligence is the ability to recognize emotions in yourself and others and to manage your own emotions effectively. There are five main characteristics of emotional intelligence. Knowing, managing, motivating, recognizing, and helping. Please refer to the resources in the weekly folder in our Blackboard course shell to learn more about emotional intelligence, to learn more about how one can improve their emotional intelligence and the importance of it in everyday life. 
In addition, there's an article in the weekly folder in the Blackboard course shell that discusses caffeine and the role that it plays in being the silent killer of emotional intelligence.